has been OCB has been supporting a phytoplankton taxonomy working group for the last couple of years. And they have been doing tremendous things. They've brought together talent from the informatics side with talent from the phytoplankton taxonomy side. And so Heidi and Amy are, go are going to present out some of the results of that effort. OK, excellent. Thank you, Heather and May. Um, they did a lot to help us with this workshop, so we couldn't have done it without them. Um, I realized during this session how apropos our talk is to be embedded within this session because there was a lot of talk and discussion about allometry, traits, size classes, and what I am going to talk about today is how we standardize phytoplankton taxonomic data across uh, data repositories, not just the data itself, but also preserving the provenance with regards to data collection, analysis, and documentation. Um, and in light of this, we have all these instruments that have recently been developed, I'd say over the past 10 years, these amazing instruments that have increased our ability to collect high throughput, high resolution, high volume taxonomic and particle data throughout the world's oceans. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the Imaging Flow Cytobot, or IFCB, which was developed by Heidi Sosik. Uh, many of you may recognize the FlowCam, which is something I have personally used in the past and use currently. Um, so we have lots of these instruments that we can take out not only on research field campaigns, but also plop into uh, time series observatories so we can get all this amazing data. Um, and I would say a picture is worth a thousand words here, right? I mean, I could stare at these images all day because they're just so detailed and just think about all of the information that you're getting from these images. You're getting taxonomic traits, taxonomic size, you're getting particle size, um, biovolume, you can drive biovolume abundances, size classes, phytoplankton taxonomic groups, all this information that can be used to develop and validate a lot of these models that we've been talking about over the past week. So a couple of great examples from Heidi's Martha's Vineyard Observatory, where she has an IFCB at the observatory site. And they have been trending two diatoms. So this is Guinardia, and Didylum is on the second plot. The blue lines are the automated classification, and the red dots here represent manual classification, which I'll talk about briefly later. And you can see how the two colors match up pretty well. And it's pretty apparent how well we can, we can uh, describe these, these time series trends of these two taxa. So this is important for monitoring changes due to some sort of environmental parameters. And what we can do with these data we, is we can aggregate these from species level information to uh, group specific information such as lumping all the diatoms together, or you can go into size class carbon abundances. So once you have this information up here, there's a lot of uh, lot that you can do with this data as far as aggregation. And these sorts of products are really good for you know, satellite algorithm development, validation, and uh, ecosystem model development. So this is just an example of some IFCB data collected off of the east coast of the US. And I believe these are surface samples that Heidi has collected um, on, uh, on the Pisces recently in the past few years. And then on the right hand side is, uh, is a satellite map showing a PFT algorithm. And this, the colors represent diatom chlorophyll from 0.01 to 30 milligrams per meter cubed. And on the left panel, this is diatom carbon from 0.1 to 30 micrograms of carbon per, per liter. So not only do you get this high spatial resolution that you don't necessarily get from a time series station, you can also use this information to validate, 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 validate. That's a very important part of what we do. So getting this high spatial resolution along with the temporal resolution of these data is critical for our model development and validation. So what we want to point out here, this is our group that we have brought together for the purposes of standardizing taxonomic data into a file format 
that is reproducible and standardized across various repositories. And this is important because we want to have this data accessible to everyone in the same standardized format for data validation and development, or model validation and, and development. And the great thing about this group is we have a really large diversity of backgrounds in this group. We have uh, data scientists such as Stace and Joe and Chris Proctor who have done a lot of this work to get us to a point where we have a data file format almost ready to release that people can use. Um, we also have, you know, we have phytoplankton ecologists. We also have Adam Shepard from Beaker Demo. He's also involved in this project, which is also important. And then we have some algorithm developer, developers in this group. So it's really important that we come from all angles of, all, of users as well as data scientists who might use these data. So we've had about four meetings since we convened in the spring of 2017. And we have used the, uh, a use case scenario as a strategy to really break down this problem and figure out how to tackle what are the parameters that we need in these data files and who are the users and what do they need to see. So this use case scenario really helped us to strategize and envision what people might want out of these data. So as I've already mentioned, um, our, the one concern we have in our community is that we don't have a way to standardize these phytoplankton taxonomic data across platforms. And now that we have these systems that you know, collect hundreds of thousands of millions of images, you know, more, more data, more problems. So we need to figure out how do we get these into a format that everybody can use and no matter if you go to the Beaker Demo repository or NASA CBUS repository, everything looks the same and is accessible to everyone. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to archive all of the relevant information into a standard format that everybody can use. And then from this data, people can generate remote sensing products such as abundance, biovolumes, carbon, and size class estimates. And within this process, and even more importantly, we want to preserve not only the data, but the metadata and the processing information. And this way, people can reprocess the data, reprocess the data as needed, if, you know, in case for some reason something was identified incorrectly or you know, something has changed throughout the process. You want to make sure you have all of that information in hand to reprocess the data. And then lastly, we want these files to um, have the ability to interact with existing systems, such as the repository Ecotax and also the IFCB, IFCB dashboard. So there are many things to think about as we're developing um, the standard, standardized file format. So the, the first thing we're going to recommend is that we need to preserve the raw images. So that is the very base level of information that we're collecting with these instruments because we want these available to people to reprocess as needed. Secondly, we, want the, we will recommend that the annotated and classified images be preserved in some sort of external host, such as Ecotaxa, which is a, is a web-based program where images can be uploaded and annotated and kept and preserved on the web, and everybody can access it. So we need something like that, or the IFCB dashboard, which if you, if anybody's looked at Heidi So6 data, or if anybody has an IFCB, they're familiar with the dashboard. That's where all the images can preside, and anybody can download them and process them however they want. So we want these sorts of things available to the public. Lastly, what we're going to do is recommend the aggregation of all this information for each image that's collected into one data file. And if anybody has submitted to a CBAS file, and I'll describe that in a second, Basically, every row of data, it represents one image, and then there's, image, there's information associated with, with each image. So once that's all aggregated into one file, you can use that file to create other summary products, such as biovolume, carbon of phytoplankton groups, across a sample, across a field campaign, across a time series. Whatever your data are, we can create these products from this data file. So this is a nice flowchart that actually stays provided um, for us. And I'm not going to go through this whole flowchart, obviously. But what I just wanted to show is how complex 
the data collection and processing of image data is. This is no small feat to think about all of the steps that are required to appropriately address this problem. So, you know, we have all the information or provenance from the instrument settings that were used to actually collect the data, and there are many different settings. I know with FlowCam, there's lots of little knobs that you can turn. So we need to understand what were those knobs that you turned to collect that data, because that actually influences how the image is collected. Um, next, you have how that image was processed. Um, and so you need your processing method and version and how were those images translated into information. And then lastly, we want information on the classifier. So when you take those images and you classify them into taxonomy or taxonomic groups, we need to understand how did you do that? What sort of image library did you use to do that and have that available so that people can see? So we want as much transparency as possible when processing these data. Because we're not all taxonomists, mistakes can be made. So we really need to have all of this information in check and available so that we can have all the information needed for reprocessing or evaluating the quality of the data. So the best practices that we recommend um, will be to determine how we specify our taxa so that other people can use our groups. So I'll talk about um, the world, um, I always forget the acronym for this thing, the, the World uh, Marine Species website, of course I just messed it up, but anyway, it's WORMS, it's a, it's a repository that basically has all the taxonomic ideas, ideas of all organisms that exist in the world and there's an ID number to it that's attached to these numbers. And so I'll talk about that in a second, but we're talking about, we're thinking about implementing something like that to uh, have traceability of the taxonomic IDs. So the other thing we need is how, we need to think about how we provide the sufficient metadata that goes along with the file. So metadata including not only instrument information, how the data was processed, but also information about the location, the, the station ID, the geolocation, the time, all these sorts of things have to go into this data file. And lastly, how do we structure the data file format so it can be passed through other workflows? So we want it usable by, by different mechanisms. So I'm using CBAS as an example because that's what I'm most familiar with, but obviously we hope to see other repositories adopt a similar format um, for their taxonomic data. But for those of you who have never seen a CBAS data file, which is, uh, CBAS is a NASA data repository. If you are funded by NASA to go out on a field campaign to collect information, you must submit your data to this repository in a specific format. And this format usually includes uh, two parts. It should include two parts. It, the first part, uh, the top part is the metadata headers which includes information such as your geolocations, times, et cetera, station information, and it will also include in the second half a data matrix, which has all of your information for your measured uh, products. So on the right is just a quick example of what a typical CBAS header might look like. So you'll see you have station name, you have uh, investigators, you have time, date, lat law, and every single piece of information associated with that particular sample. So in addition to our, our typical CBAS header that you would see with uh, optical data, for example, we will also ha um, require that a user who is, who is submitting taxonomic data to CBAS or any repository to also include such information as volume sampled, volume imaged, uh, camera resolution or pixel, pixel per micron, information about their instruments, and also their namespaces, which I'll also talk about that, what that means in a second. So we want every piece of information about that sample somewhere either in this file or an associated file that is submitted with your data. So some size information that we have settled on to be included in such files include ferret diameter, um, min and max, which is basically the minimum and, and maximum sort of length of the, of the particles. We, can al we will also include a measure of biovolume and area cross-section. And all of these measures are outputs of IFCB data. So the example I'm giving right now is specific to what an IFCB um, data file would look like, but we're also working towards data files to include information from, say, a flow cam and other instrument, instrument types. 
Um, and in addition to the size information, um, we're back to the worms. Uh, APID, which is just a trace traceable reference number that takes us back to uh, the, a taxonomic rank. So that we'll have somebody, instead of saying in this line here, oh, it was a carethrin or a didylum or whatever your taxonomic genus or species was, instead that you're gonna include an APID. So this is a traceable way, and I'll talk about this in a, in a second, but this makes it more traceable and easy uh, to use in the long term. Um, and in addition to, you know, uh, actual APHIA or taxonomic ID, we're also what we're calling a namespace. So this is a user-defined name for something that doesn't necessarily have something taxonomic related to it. For example, you have a bubble. There's no taxonomic ID for a bubble. Or you have a piece of detritus or something that, you know, that doesn't have any sort of taxonomic information. So in your, when your documentation, you're going to say, my namespace of this was a bubble. So then we know, okay, that's not anything that's important. If I'm looking at diatoms, I don't care that there was a bubble. So this helps us to kind of trace how people are naming things and make it more standardized. And the other thing we're gonna have people include is the identification from the, their automated system versus their human or manual uh, validated system. So there are some instances where the automated uh, classification will identify something right on and you checked it, you're like, yay, it's the right thing. And then there's other times where the automated system identified it as a Thalassiosyra and it was really a catasterous. I know that's probably not the best example, but you know what I mean. So you include that information as well. So again, this provenance traceability of every step of your data processing is preserved in, these, in this documentation. Um, back to APIDs, this is something I just learned about not too long ago through this process. Um, so the nice thing about APIDs and why, why we are recommending them, now let me go back and say there's other um, reference libraries that can be used like UniUK and others, so we're not saying only use worms, but we're just using that as a good example because it's available to everyone. Um, but the nice thing about using some sort of reference library like worms is the traceability. So for instance, if Guanardia turns into another species because of genetic information, you know, DNA, RNA, whatever, um, that number doesn't change. So if someone clicks on that number, if this changes species, that's traceable. So that's why it's better to have a number in there than actually name, it's a carethrin, it's this, because if that changes, how do you go back and change all those data files with a different species? So not only does it make it traceable to changes taxonomically, but it also, you can also trace taxonomic ranks. So you can see what was the genus, what was the family, what was the order, blah, blah, blah. So you get all this information from an APID. So that's why we felt it was the, one of the better options for, for tracing this information. So in summary, wow, I went really fast. So hopefully there's questions. Um, so our objective here was to develop best standards and practices for, for collating, processing, and submitting these data to our repository. And you know, these imaging technologies are become, truly becoming a standard part of data collection. Now we know large scale oceanographic field campaigns, exports, names. I mean, th there's a ton of uh, field campaigns out there right now that are using th these technologies. There's time series stations like Heidi Sosix and Colleen Mouse are using IFCB data to track changes of communities over time in one place. So we need a way to process these data, understand these data better. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have focused mainly on IFCD-derived uh, products, but we are, we are expanding to things like FlowCam and Ecotaxa for other data types to come in. So that will kind of be the next step. This was our first take on the situation, and it took a lot to get there, but by the end of the summer, we should actually have a data file format that we can start working with. Um, and having said that, we can also think about other types of systems, like zooplankton imaging systems, the UDP. Something like this can be applied to these other systems as well. It's not just limited to phytoplankton imaging systems. And lastly, we want your input. So we're not, this is not a, done in a vacuum. You know, we want the community involved as well. We want people to have their opinion and if they have a suggestion of something they want to include, we can talk about that. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is out of this working group, we expect some deliverables, not only the data file format, but also a technical memo that will describe in detail um, all of the um, instrument information and definitions, 
as well as data processing recommendations, data five file format recommendations in much detail. So with the TM and any other publications that came out, come out that we're really going to detail how we recommend people to submit these sorts of data so that we can get out here and start using all this amazing data that we're collecting all over the world and validate algorithms. So um, that's it for me. So if there's any questions, I have planted a couple of data scientists in the room that can answer questions that I don't know. So <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, Amy. That was really a nice presentation, and I'm super grateful to this working group. It's really going to move the field forward. Um, my question has to do, one thing I've been concerned about with some of these automated imaging systems is some inherent biases that might happen because oftentimes they're plumbed to sur surface underway systems. I work a lot in what I consider pretty dilute environments, and so to do manual cell counts or really characterize. I think with a um, flow cam you can do more of this, but like actually concentrating dilute volume into mm -hmm. a small volume so that you can really kind of quantify what's in a, a, that larger volume. Mm -hmm. And so my concern is, is if we have IFCBs plumbed to surface underway and they're just seeing a very small volume parcel of water, that large carbon heavy cells that might be rare are gonna be missed. And I'm wondering if your group is tackling any, you know, ideas behind depth resolution and sampling, concentrating cells, um, ways that we don't end up getting really biased data about um, what's going on in the plankton from these instruments. Sorry, that was a long question. No, I mean, that's, that's an, we are not tackling that, I'll answer that. <laughs> the short answer is we are not tackling that, although those are very, those are very valid concerns, and I know there are other people thinking about this and doing some comparisons to write this up. Um, our primary objective uh, was just to look at how do we get these data into a file format that's standardized, but I think, I think once we have these data available to people, that's kind of the next step, right, to start thinking about these instrument comparisons. If you collect something from microscopy versus an IFCB in the same sample or surface samples and do something like that. Like, are you capturing everything? If there's only one cell per, you know, liter or more, you know, like, if you don't see that, then, but, you know, in the end, if you're talking about satellite validation and things, you're not, probably not going to see that, you know, those, that small amount of cells of that particular taxon, but it's still important for modeling. So, sorry, I'm rambling now. But yes, I think once we have these data available to people, we can start tackling these, these concerns, absolutely. Yep. Who had their hand up? <laughs> Work your way backward. <laughs> Hi, Ben Twining. Uh, do you, I know this, this is also maybe a little bit out of your scope, but maybe closer than than Bethany's question. Um, do you have recommendations about um, image archiving um, you know, over time? Obviously, you have a massive amount of, of images, but there's a, a lot of value in those um, yeah. that this data is reduced to. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Well, and that was kind of the first part. So we want to preserve every part of the imaging process, right, from the raw images to the annotated. So. And you know, at this point, CBAS doesn't really have that capability from a searchable standpoint. I mean, that's the key. You can throw them in somewhere, you know, on a hard drive in a closet, and they're still there, but they're not searchable. Um, so that's why at this point we're recommending somewhere like an ISCB dashboard or Ecotaxa, which you can join if you contact them. You can get a password and you can join. That way, those images are preserved and publicly available. And the nice thing about Ecotaxa, um, you can also use it to annotate your images. So yes, we want people to be able to preserve and have their images accessible for what you're suggesting. Yes. Stephanie Dukevich, MIT. Um, thank you. It's, this sounds like an absolutely extraordinary data set you're putting together. Um, I, uh, as a modeler, um, what we generally want, are interested in is carbon, is mm -hmm. biomass. Um, and I saw in some of your flow diagrams that was somewhere you were going, but in the last one you sort of ended up with bio volume. Um, are you planning to put that combination, you know, that, that conversion? And then I guess along with that question, um, 
the error estimates, um, are they going to be propagated down? Because that's going to be a big, you know, when you go from bio volume to mm -hmm. mass, there's going to be some error estimates. So is that something that you've also thought about as putting error, uh, you know, error propagation through this system? <laughs> uh, well, the first part about carbon, I think once we have the basic size measurements, so the ferret, min and max, the um, bio volume and things like that, then those can be converted to carbon, right? And there's different ways to do that, to convert to carbon. Um, so we've talked about either leaving that up to the user to use their own method to convert to carbon, or we might do something in-house where we have an automated way to, to calculate some carbon abundance using a specific method, but then they still have the raw information to calculate it their own way. So that is a downstream product that we will make available, but they'll also be able to choose their own. Um, to your second question, that is a bigger question. Um, uncertainties, we've talked a little bit about that, and I think that starts even with your, your, your image collection and data processing. So that's kind of the next big can of worms to tackle as far as how you even think about uncertainties, not only your data collection, but your classifier. So there's a lot. That's a, yes, so I think that is the next thing that should definitely be tackled and again, maybe with this, when these data are available to people, maybe that's something you can start thinking about and doing and get another group to do it too. <laughs> get some fresh, fresh faces in there. <laughs> yes. Susanna Neuer, ASU. Um, so, the, so these are uh, charismatic phytoplankton, right? What, what you've shown. Yes. Um, most of the phytoplankton are not charismatic. They look like small sure. blobs. Sure. And yes. you need genetic information to tease those apart. <laughs> now, I understand this may be co too complex. I mean, obviously, the question is what, what is really needed, right? Is it the biomass? Is the size? Would the size be sufficient? How much taxonomic resolution do we really need? If we really want to look at functional you know, function and may, potential mixotrophy and, and, and things like that, we probably need more information and, and that may have to do with genomic mm -hmm. um, data. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think with a lot of these field campaigns, these things are being collected simultaneously. So not only do you have the images, but you also have the metagenomic information to go along with it. So you're right, this is not the end all. It doesn't give us all the information, but I think it gives a, it opens up this huge world for us that we can do way more things with these data than we were, we were able to before. So I, I agree with you, but if we collect everything at the same time, you know, everything, then, you know, we can get at these questions for sure. Um, I just want to, kind of, Yvonne, I'm upset that NASA got it. Um, I just want to kind of follow up on the question that Bethany had about, you know, like sampling size, sampling volume, and how does that affect that, you know, the rare species stuff. And from the NASA perspective, you know, kind of, it's not that we don't care, but it doesn't really contribute so much to remote sensing. But from that perspective, that's the reason why we really, I mean, it took us, I think, a year and a half to agree on what is all the metadata that goes inside. Mm -hmm. So the information about the volume sample, volume image and stuff, is something that we want to have there, not just because of pretty stuff, but that the final user, such as you or Stephanie, whoever, has that information in hand. And hopefully by combining that, and, and, uh, and we, we, always, we always ask um, submitters to give us really, really high-end um, methodology description. Combination of that is going to allow the final users to make their decision. So from the perspective of remote sensing, rare species really don't contribute, but for, the, for any kind of ecology studies or anything like that, Yes, that might not be the best data set for you, but it has to be on you to decide. Um, I think curating something to that point, we're not there yet. So. Yeah. Hello, Leo from Bermuda Institute of Science, Sciences. So I use Ecotaxa mm -hmm. for so plankton and, and some protists. And maybe I'm, I'm missing one of the nuances. I know that Ecotaxa has, you can improve a lot of what they do, especially in the hierarchical, and if they adopt worms, it will be much better. But they are already providing all the information that you are said that you want to obtain. Mm -hmm. So, so would it be better like try to move the community to our ecotaxa and trying to merge what we have? Just, just thinking of not duplicating efforts everywhere. Just that's my maybe I'm missing something. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, if I understand your question correctly, we're not trying to replicate what we do. What we're trying to do is put what Ecotaxa does and what IFCB dashboard does and, and your data processing techniques and put it in a file format that can go in various repositories. And the other thing, you know, with Ecotaxa, which is fantastic because you have a large library there and it helps you to do your classification and it does spit out the information. However, that information does come from your instrument's information. Like the, if it um, spits out equivalent spherical diameter, all those things, those things came from the flow cam. And it's just kind of aggregating everything with your image data, right? So what we're, ta we're taking that, and, and our plan is to, to take, if somebody has processed their images in Ecotaxa, take all of that information and put it into a data file that is accessible to other folks. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> Stace might be able to answer it better. She's our data scientist. They've been working hard on this. Hi, so. to answer that question, we had Mark Pitterell, I'm sorry if I say his name incorrectly, okay. from Ecotaxa. He's the developer of Ecotaxa. So we have him on the working group. And essentially, think of, it, think of this file format and metadata as a subsetting of what, you go in, what goes into Ecotaxa. When you open your, I've looked at your data actually in Ecotexa, and it is overwhelming the amount of information in there, right? So we have selected an important subset of those data to go into this standard file format. Thank you, Stace. <laughs> Good? Okay. Thank you.